running water is one of the most important agent to do some erosional work as well as depositional work into the path over which it flows now the course over which the river flows is often called a river bed that means the uh, passage the channel over which uh, the rocks are exposed and over those rocks the river flows is called river bed now if you look at the uh, river the rivers flowing to the oceans drain about almost 68 percent of earth's land surface so it's almost one third of the uh, total earth's land area so by this way river gradually mold the land by eroding away the material and depositing them in some other places and the river carried materials were deposited that is a narrow depressed area that we call as basin so river erodes from the inland areas from the high altitude areas and deposited it in the low land areas in the depressed areas generally those areas are the lakes or the uh, oceans or it may be uh, any kind of dam also so in case of dam it is a uh, it is not permanent um, but oceans lakes these are permanent basin now the term watershed we often hear this term previously it was used for indicating the boundary dividing the area from which the river gets its water so there was a area from which the water feed to this channel that is the river receives this water from this channel this entire area is bounded by a high altitude areas which basically uh, separates it out from the adjacent uh, river feed areas this boundary is basically previously known as watershed but this concept was changed in the year 1977 when a conference was held in argentina and nowadays the term watershed has come to mean synonymous with drainage basin that means this entire area which is fed the river by the water that means from the entire area from which river receives water that was previously known as drainage basin and the boundary of this drainage basin is known as area that is the drainage basin becomes synonymous to watershed so nowadays watershed and drainage basin are meaning same so according to the conference now watershed is defined as any surface area from which runoff resulting from rainfall and they are collected and drained through a common point over which the river starts its journey so it becomes synonymous with the drainage basin or often it is called catchment area that means from where river catches or takes its water so the boundary of this drainage basin or watershed now these boundaries are known as drainage divides so these divides these high altitude areas are basically the separating landmass between two adjacent drainage basin or between two adjacent watersheds now if we look at the entire journey of a river the path of the river from its source to the mouth 
that means where it meets with a permanent uh, body of water that may be ocean or lake uh, this entire part is known as river course and this entire river course can be distinguished into three major portions or three major parts or three major courses the first part which is close to its source and mainly restricted in the uh, high altitude areas where the change in slope or change in gradient is very high with minimum lateral displacement this portion is known as upper course the next stage which mainly occurs in the flatland areas below the mountain belts this is known as middle course and lastly near the mouth the entire course is known as lower course now this three upper course middle course and lower course are also named with another name that is this upper course is known as young stage where the energy condition of the river is very high because of the change in gradient is uh, very sharp or very high with minimum lateral uh, displacement the middle course or mid course is known as mature stage and the last one that is the lower course where the energy of the river is extremely low that uh, portion or that course is known as old stage so young stage in this the mountainous portion middle course is the mature stage and lower course is the old stage now as you can see that each part of the river or each course of the river have different energy condition and that energy condition is reflected by the change in elevation with lateral displacement that is the slope or gradient and that will be ultimately reflected on the supply of water or flowage of water through the channel and the work done by those flowing water so each and every course each and every stage of the river has some distinctive features which form due to the energy condition uh, at that particular position and as we move from the source to the mouth that is as we moving the uh, from upstream to the uh, from source to the downstream areas we can see the gradually slope is decreasing with respect to gradually uh, energy condition of the flowing water is decreasing so the features or the work done that is the erosion transportation and deposition they are also changing with uh, some different stages now fluvial erosion or the erosional process of a river can be um, done by th mainly three processes the first one is known as corrosion so it is basically a simple chemical weathering processes where the uh, fluvial water or river water act as a solvent and it reacts with the uh, rocks over which it flows and make them soluble so by chemical way it basically erodes or weathered the country rock that is known as corrosion the second process is known as corrosion or abrasion in this process the country rock that means the rock over which the river flows they are eroded or they are wearing away by the impact or grinding action of the particles 
which are in moving condition with the flowing water that means whenever a flow of water that means river flows it contains some amount of uh, debris or some amount of sedimentary particles which are already eroded and taken into the uh, water column now those eroded particles those sediments they are involved into the mechanical process by which they impact on the channel beds and they grind or they erode by physical way the country rocks so here the sedimentary particles which are already within the flowing water those are basically responsible for further erosion of the channel rock and it is often happen that during those processes the sedimentary particles which are already within the flowing water they often mutually collide with each other so during this collision of two particles those particles can often break and becomes more finer and finer and more smoother also so due to prolonged uh, impact between two particles if this occurs frequently this impact between two particles occurs frequently then they will broke to smaller pieces and often they will become more smooth so due to the impact of the sediments which are already in the flowing water the country rock may weather and eroded as well as those sediments those tools basically these sediments are act as tools they can also reduce their size by impacting between themselves by collision between themselves and becomes more smoother this is the process of corrosion or abrasion and the third process is known as eversion eversion is a form of corrosion basically uh, in this process the sheer force of water is responsible to erode the country rock so in corrosion the sediments within the flowing water is responsible for erosion in eversion it is the shear of water that may be the uh, impact of water that may be the swirling action or circular motion occur some uh, within the water they are basically responsible for weathering and erosion of the country rock so it is the shear force of water due to which the erosion occurs and this process is known as eversion now whenever a river flows within a channel the river mainly occurs two types of erosion or two uh, of the bedrock that is the vertical erosion that is uh, caused by the channels bed load abrading the bed that means over which the river flows that will be further lower down by repeated uh, friction or repeated action of the uh, shear what shear force of water or the sediments carried by the river and the second process is the lateral erosion that is work done on the lateral walls of the channel that is called banks on the banks of the channel so if you consider this is a river channel cross section so vertical erosion means this lower portion of the channel that becomes gradually lower and lower by the by these processes of erosion and during this process it often happen that the portion of the uh, bank suppose this was the amount of river water up to which the uh, channel walls they are in contact with the river water so these areas all these areas they are in direct contact with the river water 
so they can be directly eroded by these three processes corrosion corrosion and abortion but what about this upper portion these two portions it happens that this low portion where the river water is directly in contact with the uh, channel bedrock they are eroded so often it happens that this portion is eroded and the river uh, channel now becomes this so you can see now this above portion which is uh, not in contact this vertical wall which is basically not in contact with the uh, channel water they are basically hanging over this surface there is no support below this wall because of the uh, erosion downward erosion or vertical erosion of the river water so with enhancing erosion of this bottom portion of the channel this upper portion this upper wall of the bank is gradually becomes floating and supportless so ultimately after some time it will collapse so in this way the banks or the lateral walls of the channel they are weathered and eroded now the factors that cause erosion are mainly the volume of water that means the amount of water passing through a passing through the channel or passing through a particular point in some particular time that is also known as discharge secondly the velocity of water that means the uh, time taken for a fixed volume of water to pass a common point that determines the speed and that is also affecting the physical impact of water on the uh, channel rocks third factor is the gradient or the slope that is change in elevation with respect to lateral dispersion and the fourth one is the density of fluid so this density is also important because uh, it also affect the streams power to work on the country rocks and lastly the composition and structure of the channel rock over which the fluid uh, flows over which the river water flows if the uh, bed rock has numerous weak planes numerous faults holes or joints then they are the pre-existing weak planes along which the river water can easily act and they can easily erode the, um, by working on those weak areas similarly the composition is also very important suppose the river water is slightly acidic and that water is flowing over a carbonate rock so the carbonate rock when they came into contact with this acidic river water they becomes easily eroded by chemical weathering processes but if that acidic river water is flowing over some silicate rock then they are not easily weathered and eroded by chemical weathering processes so the composition and structure of the country rock of the uh, channel bedrock is also deep, uh, very important factors um, and they also determines how much erosional works will go on uh, as the river flows over uh, these points now the capacity of a stream to do work is known as the stream power so how much work done or how much work a river uh, can do that is known as stream power uh, streams are very powerful geomorphic agents uh, and it is they are capable of eroding carrying and depositing sediments so the capacity of 
to do this all these work that is erosion carrying transporting and deposition this capacity is known as stream power so stream power can be mathematically explained by a formula which is omega is equal to rho w g q s where rho w is the density of water so you can see that the stream power that is how much work done or how much work a river water can do that is dependent on the density of the water so density increase stream power will also increase that is directly proportional so g small g is acceleration due to gravity thirdly q that is the amount of discharge and that q is also dependent on the uh, velocity of the flowing river the channel roughness and as well as the amount of water so the velocity uh, amount of water passing through a point in a unit time and the channel roughness that will be ultimately uh, reflecting on the stream power and lastly the gradient the channel slope that determines how quickly uh, water moves from one point to another point with change in slope so all these factors are basically enhancing or decreasing the stream power that means stream power is directly dependent on the density of water acceleration due to gravity g value which is more or less constant for any particular area or for any particular point um, the slope the velocity of the flowing water amount of flowing water as well as channel roughness now the ability of uh, flowing water to erode and transport rocks is a function of streams kinetic energy now we all know that kinetic energy is symbolized as ek and it is a function or it is a product of the mass and velocity and we can symbolize them as uh, half mv square where m is the mass of the water and v is the uh, fluid velocity now one french hydraulic engineer antonio chizi he estimates or he try to show that the velocity of river water is dependent on the hydraulic radius that is r and we all know that hydraulic radius is basically the uh, cross sectional area of the channel divided by the weighted perimeter so chizi showed that the velocity of channel is dependent on the hydraulic radius and the slope that is the channel gradient and a coefficient also is there which expressing the gravitational and frictional forces acting upon the water so he formula formalized the velocity of water within a channel as v is equal to c c is a constant root over r into s r is the hydraulic radius and s is the slope or channel gradient now if we substitute the velocity value the v value of chezy's equation in the kinetic energy formula that is half mv square we get that now kinetic energy value is mc rs by 2 so we can see that the kinetic energy uh, of the flowing water is depending on the hydraulic radius and the slope of the gradient 
as well as the mass and we all know that if this mass is uh, a function or this mass is indicating the amount of water flowing through the channel so the volume is represented uh, by one factor or volume is depending by mass so ultimately the kinetic energy of the flowing water in a given point is directly dependent on the amount of water passing through that point so not only amount uh, with amount there is hydraulic radius and channel gradient so from this equation uh, we can say that the deeper and faster a stream the greater its kinetic energy and larger its potential to erode so that is why in the mountainous region where we get that the uh, slope or channel gradient is high the valley is far deeper due to the due to very uh, higher increase of channel gradient with minimum lateral dispersion uh, the faster the water moves so as all these properties all these factors are higher that is why in the mountainous portion the kinetic energy of the flowing river is also high and that is why maximum erosion was done in the mountainous portion that is in the young stage of the uh, river whereas in the lower stage or in the uh, old stage there the gradient becomes low with lateral dispersion so uh, hydraulic radius uh, decreases channel becomes uh, shallow but wide and the kinetic energy also decreases so due to this uh, the work done that is the particularly the erosion in the lower course is also decreases now if we look at the erosional uh, property that is we came to know that that is dependent on uh, stream velocity or water flow velocity now one famous scientist philip hagelstrom he tried to explain or he tried to establish the relationship between the stream flow velocity with respect to the grain size of the sediments so he basically try to uh, show or try to explain with the help of a series of experiments that how much energy is required that means the flow energy is required to erode or to dislodge a particular sediment size we know that there are different sediment sizes starting from the smallest one the clay seal sand granule pebble cobble and boulder and uh, the sediment size is gradually increasing from clay to boulder so as the size is increasing of the sediment naturally their mass or their weight is also becomes higher and higher so to dislodge the grains of different size having different weight it requires different energy condition in a uh, blind state we can think that uh, as the grain size is increasing so the weight of the grains are also increasing and it should be that uh, gradually as we move from clay to the boulder size it requires higher and higher energy but in natural condition uh, philip hagelstrom in his experimental setup he experimentally uh, set the natural condition and he found that the velocity required that is the energy required to erode different grain sizes 
is not a simple one. Rather, he found that the least energy required to erode a sedimentary particle that is the grain size of medium grain sand. From medium grain sand, this is the grain size in the x axis, and this is the velocity that is entrained known as entrainment velocity that is the velocity uh, in which the erosion or the movement of the grain starts. So that means erosion. So it is the least energy required to erode the uh, medium grain sands. But in this much energy, the lower size particles, that is the sealed or clay size particles, as well as the higher size particles of sand, uh, sand, granule, and boulder, they cannot be eroded. So the medium grain sands requires the least energy to erode. So he found that although clay size particles they are finer in size and that is they are uh, much less in weight much lighter compared to the sand grains but the clay size particles requires higher energy for entrainment and this is due to the cohesiveness or cohesion force between the clay grains or clay size particles. This cohesiveness property of the clay size particles, they basically held one clay size particles to other. That's a sort of sticky thing by which the clay particles are mutually joined with one another. So, in a from a natural deposition of clay, it is very difficult to separate out with natural flow one individual clay grain, clay grain rather than they are eroding as a clump, as a lump. So, whenever they are eroding as a lump, it effectively increases its size and thereby required uh, higher velocity higher energy condition so individual clay grain, uh, clay grain erosion or finer grain size erosion is very difficult because of the cohesiveness property and that is why they required higher amount of energy higher amount of entrain velocity to start moving at the same time the higher size particles of medium grain sand that is the pebble cobble and boulder they are higher in size they are larger in size compared to sand grains so they will be um, much heavier in weight so normally they for that they will require higher energy condition that means higher flow velocity so this this lower line just indicates the entrainment velocity that is the velocity required for a particular size of grains to start moving. Above this line, the entire portion or the entire regime is the erosional regime. That is, in this velocity, flow velocity condition, all the grain size of any given class, they are in moving condition. They are eroded. Now, you can see that this entire entrainment velocity is not a particular line but rather it is a zone or it is a band now the entrainment velocity is a band because the velocity to entrain or to move a particular size particle is not only dependent on the size of the uh, particle but it is also dependent on the shape of the particle as well as how the particle is lying over a surface. Suppose uh, this is a bed over which a grain occurs, a flat grains. 
suppose a uh, this type of grain occurs over a grain now this grain can occur in this fashion this grain can occur in this fashion as well as this grain can occur in this fashion so depending on this different orientation the grains required different flow velocity different energy condition to starts moving now in the extreme bottom portion you will find another line another inclined line which is indicating as the fall velocity this line basically indicates that when energy condition drops when energy condition or flow velocity reduces below this line the grains are not able to move the grain are not able to uh, transport from one place to another and they will settle down they will be deposited so this is known as the fall velocity and this will occur with decreasing energy with decreasing the mean flow velocity so within the erosional regime within the entrainment velocity and the fall velocity line there lies the transport regime and within this regime within this mean flow velocity zone all the grains are moving now it is very interesting that although the clay size particles require very high energy condition require very high mean flow velocity to start moving but once they are in moving state they required a very low amount of energy to continue its moving to continue its journey and it is very uh, difficult to settle them if the moving water has minimum energy condition so that is why although the clay particles require higher entrainment velocity but the transportation regime is very large very wide whereas in the higher part that is in the higher size class the cobble boulder size class they required higher energy they required higher mean flow velocity to entrainment to move as well as with minimum drop with very little drop in energy condition with very little drop in mean flow velocity they came down below the fall velocity line and they starts depositing so that is why just crossing the mountainous region when the river enters the flat land area where the gradient becomes lower and energy drops occur we found that there will be large size boulders uh, in the channel bed or in the banks so that indicates that in the mountainous portion that is in the young stage where the velocity condition mean flow velocity is much higher the river is able to carry those large size particles those gravel size particles but with minimum decrease with low amount of decrease in velocity when river reaches the flat land area the fall the higher particles the gravel size particles they came down below the fall velocity and they starts depositing but still the finer size particles that is the sand and clay size particles they are still in the moving condition they are still in the transporting regime the flow velocity or the energy condition of the river is such still in that uh, condition in that flow stage that they are able to carry further the finer size particles particularly the sand and uh, clay size particles so this diagram is a very important diagram and this will uh, depict us how a sediments 
uh, of different size they are eroded and transported and deposited with changing energy condition that means with changing mean flow velocity of the river and that is why we are getting different size of grains depositing at different course at different stage of the river now all the materials that are eroded by the uh, river or that are eroded by a stream they are called the river load or stream load now the eroded materials that a river carry that is a stream load they can be carried by three ways the first type is the dissolve or solute load that is uh, these uh, country rock materials they are taken within the water as a soluble material by chemical weathering processes so the original property of the country rock original property of the load that will be lost due to these processes the second process is known as the suspended load here the turbulence energy of the stream is such that it will always float the uh, particle within the water body and in this type of load movement the particle will never came into contact with the bottom surface with the uh, river bed it will always remain floating uh, anywhere within the water column and that is why this type of load is known as suspended load the last type of load is known as bed load or traction load in this type the materials the eroded particles they are always in contact with the bottom surface with the bottom bed rock now this bed load or traction load movement can be of two types one is rolling where a uh, particle during its traction load movement always uh, came into contact with the bottom surface and the uh, surface of the particle is gradually changing that is it is rolling uh, and came into contact with different times different surfaces and the second type of bed load or traction load movement is the sliding type of movement where a particular one surface of the uh, sediment is always keep in contact with the bottom surface so in uh, rolling movement suppose this one is a uh, sediment grain if i draw a three dimensional diagram and a just uh, more or less a cube or box shaped uh, sediment grain moving over this surface so in rolling different surfaces of this grain alternatively came into contact with the bottom surface so now this surface is came into contact with the bottom surface next stage this surface is came into contact with the bottom surface after that this will be came into contact with the bottom surface so with every uh, passing points different surfaces are came into contact with the bottom surface but in sliding type of movement particular one surface is remain in contact with the bottom surface so this surface this bottom surface is fixed in contact with the bottom surface it will not topples down with movement so these are the two different types of bed load or traction load movement now a stream can carry different size particles the biggest size of grain a stream can move as traction load or bed load that is known as stream competence because that indicates the energy condition 
of the river and you can see that when the a stream carry a sediment by suspended load the energy condition is high they, that is why there is lo, uh, lots of turbulence is there which is basically able to lift the grain from the surface from the bed rock with decreasing energy or with increasing the weight of the uh, material the grains move as bed load or traction load because in this case the energy condition of the flowing water is not sufficient to lift them from the uh, bottom surface from the bedrock so here relatively the energy condition is high and in the same energy condition that is why we move we uh, can found that in the suspended suspended load there are finer size particles whereas in the in the same given energy condition we found that in the bed load there are coarser particles large size particles so the energy condition in the given energy condition the largest size or the biggest size particle a stream can carry that is known as stream competence and the capacity of the stream is defined by the maximum amount of sediment particles maximum amount of debris including all the types suspended load solute load and bed load that is known as or uh, by this way the stream can carry uh, all the materials uh, particularly the traction by traction load or bed load by this uh, process that is known as its capacity so in stream competence it is the largest size particles here we in we define or here we uh, try to point out the size of the particle and here uh, we define or we try to indicate the amount of the largest size particles which are moving as bed load that is known as stream capacity now depending on the regional slope that is the overall uh, gradient of the area and the flow direction of the river streams are divided into certain types the first one is the consequent stream where the course of the stream the flow direction of the stream is following the original slope or regional slope of the land surface those are the consequent stream and you can see all the major rivers of india the godavari krishna kaveri they are following the regional slope you can see that these these rivers uh, if you look at the uh, regional slope of indian peninsula you can see that the uh, regional sl slope is from west to east in the bay of bengal so all these rivers are flowing from west to east following the original slope of the area so these rivers are known as consequent stream in contrast there are streams that flows in the opposite direction to the consequent stream that is these streams are not following the regional slope rather due to differential erosion they often uh, move they often flow uh, against the direction of the regional slope that is opposite to the consequent stream these are known as obsequent stream and these are generally the smaller size streams or the tributary streams which often flow opposite to the main stream and meet with the large stream uh, that follow the regional slope but uh, these are basically flowing opposite to the regional slope the obsequent streams the third type are the subsequent streams uh, these are the streams that developed on weak structures that means the uh, country rock over which the re uh, river flows that has already some pre-existing uh, weak plains 
that means the joints or folds or falls uh, over which the river water can easily erode those weak places or those weak planes and thereby move from the upstream side to downstream side so the movement of the stream is basically guided by the existence of these pre-existing weak structures of the country rock over which the water flows so often it is found that they are moving almost uh, right angles to the main consequent stream and this movement of right angle and joined with the consequent stream is mainly because of this uh, fractured nature of the country rocks or pre-existing weak structure of the country rocks these are known as subsequent stream and the last type that is the inconsequent stream these streams are not related at all to the structure of the country rocks over which the rivers flow so they show no relationship with the surface structure of the rocks these are known as inconsequent streams so that's all for today's class hope you will understand